they know that there's no right way to do the wrong thing. So they have marketing skills, PR skills, um, and paid for science on their side, which is why they've convinced so many chefs that this is the way to go. I'm Marcus from Aroma Time. Uh, opened 15 years ago in Ellenville. I'm a professionally trained chef. Um, and uh, through my journey along the way, I've been dedicated to real food. So I'm one of those restaurateurs, because a lot of us restaurateurs that like to go to shop at Whole Foods for our families, but then turn around and give you guys the cheapest food possible. And our food supply is messed up. Our food supply is screwed up. It's making us sick. It's making the planet sick. And it's, so I'm not that chef who has double standards. What I serve myself is what the restaurant has. And I'm very strict on the ingredients that come in. Um, before I start talking about salmon, because salmon's such a fascinating topic, um, I do write business books now. And most of my speeches are business, because um, I really enjoy helping other businesses. So I wrote a book, 50 Mistakes That Business Owners Make, last year, and this just came out last month. Top reasons why you still have no customers. Are you sending smoke signals instead of you're in digital age? So let's talk about salmon. Who here considers themselves an environmentalist? Who's concerned about the environment? Who wants a future environment for our kids, our grandkids, right? Everybody typically does. Most people consider, over 85% of people consider themselves environmentalists. Uh, who's concerned about their heart health? Right, a lot of us are. Who thinks that eating fish like salmon is going to help our heart? You'd hope so, right? Because our doctors are telling us, eat salmon, fatty fish, heart healthy fats. How many of you think that because you're eating farmed salmon, you're saving the wild salmon? Because there's going to be more wild salmon to eat or, 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 or flourish out there because we're eating farm salmon. That's another very common misconception. And the salmon farms are using this as marketing. For every farm salmon you eat, you're saving a wild salmon. So here's the reality of farm salmon, which by the way, is the majority of salmon. Who eats salmon in the room? Who's eaten salmon this last week, this last month? It's been farmed. Wild salmon is very hard to come by. Extremely hard to come by. The season just kicked off in Alaska. I can buy it, fresh Copper River King salmon. I'm gonna pay 30 bucks a pound for it. Okay, that's what fresh wild Alaskan salmon is right today, delivered to me. There's no really restaurants buying that and charging you $20. The economics aren't there. It's, not, it's, 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 it's totally not. So I have a website called nofarmsalmon.com where I list tons and tons of educational things, documentaries on, on salmon. I also have another website called foodfraudtv.com where I call out chefs. When you go to a restaurant and they say, oh, this is wild salmon, nine out of 10 times, it's not. Whether it's Tom Colicchio, Steven Starr, Wolfgang Puck's partners come apologize to me at the table. Um, they just tell you that because they know you want to hear that. They know that wild salmon is the buzzword. They know that wild salmon is a real deal, but they're not paying the money for it. So wild salmon has a very short season. It's in season from now until September. If a restaurant does have it out of season, they're serving frozen. There's nothing wrong with frozen. Frozen is a very, is, is a fantastic way to go. I was in a taste panel. I was on a taste panel uh, back in 1999, 80 chefs in a room. They fed us five different salmons. 90% of the chefs chose a frozen king salmon because when they catch it, they can freeze it, process it. It's had no time to hit rigor mortis. It has no time to have bacterial growth. When it's thawed and put on the plate and cooked, it's fresher than the one that was caught a week before. And it was shipped to a dock, auction, distributor, in somebody's restaurant kitchen waiting two days to get served. Fish will last 21 days, by the way. Done that experiment, 21 days properly iced, fresh. So when you smell fish into a, in a grocery store or in a store you walk in, that fish is 10, 14 days old. Um, and people think, oh wow, 
fish does go 21 days if it's stored properly fresh. So how are salmon farmed? Because you go into farmed, uh, salmon farm sites and they say raised in the wild, raised in the ocean, ocean raised. These are all buzzwords that you hear. Basically, you, they take an open pen net. 99% of salmon is farmed this way. There is a one percenter, which is called uh, containment system, inland containment system, which is drastically different. It's a step in the right direction, but it's not the best option still. So open pen containment systems, they take a pen, drop it in the ocean, in the bay, in the pristine wild. They throw about 50,000 fish in this. Then they throw a farm right next to it, throw another 50,000 fish. And they have a, 10 of these where there's a quarter of a million fish, half a million fish in a bay. Some of these farms claim, well, we're low density. Low density is one fish per bathtub instead of two fish per bathtub. That's typically what the density is. Um, salmon farms have a great way of marking this because they know that the ish, they know that there's no right way to do the wrong thing. So they have marketing skills, PR skills, um, and paid for science on their side, which is why they've convinced so many chefs that this is the way to go. Um, and when you go to their websites, it's very evident. So they put these fish in there. Um, the biggest problem is they put these fish in the migratory path of wild salmon. If wild salmon are doing good, swimming up and down this bay, going to the streams coming out, farm salmon must do good. There's very few areas in the world where salmon farms are not in the migratory path. And what happens when you put that many fish in that close of a system is there's massive disease. And you go on a tool salmon farm website and say, we don't use antibiotics or we don't treat with antibiotics. They don't treat because they just constantly feed them. And one of the most common problems with farm salmon is sea lice which is not taking antibiotic to kill it. It takes a very harsh chemical that will kill everything in the bay subsequently. I spoke to Tangier Lobster a couple, uh, a couple months ago and they had an outbreak of sea lice up in Newfoundland. The salmon farm did their chemicals, a banned chemical they weren't supposed to be using by the way, and killed all the lobsters in the bay. All the lobsters were belly up the next day. So besides sea lice, most salmon that you consume, 80% of salmon that you consume, most salmon, have heart disease, they have HSMI, they have Piscine Rio virus. It's a very highly contagious disease that weakens their heart and they have heart disease. The same thing they're eating salmon to think was benefiting us is doing a detriment. So now because salmon farms are right there in the migratory path of salmon, feces, disease, viruses, flus, everything spreads out because it's a, there's holes in the salmon, in the, in the farms. So the disease is spread out. The feces drops to the bottom of the floor of the ocean. An average salmon farm will drop waste on the bottom of the ocean floor there, the bay floor, the equivalent of a, pop, a city of a population of 10,000 on a daily basis. There's no city that can dump raw sewage into the ocean without major ramifications. But salmon farms do that on every single daily basis. They like to say they regenerate the ocean floor. There's no regenerating the ocean floor. Harvard just uh, released a study 10, 10 kilometers away, 15 kilometers away, there's live active viruses getting spread into the wild population of all fish. So when they're in the place of the, migra when they're in the, place of the migratory path of, of, of the wild salmon, the salmon swim up the stream to spawn. Salmon are very, very smart creatures. They go back to the exact spot where they were born, where they're hatched. So they go back to spawn. But now the salmon have HSMI, they have heart disease. Their heart's not strong enough to pump to get them back up the river. So a lot of these salmon never make it back up the river, first of all. The salmon that do make it back up and that spawn, you have the, the baby fry that swim back down. They swim through the nets, past the, past the farms, and out come all the diseases. When a baby fry gets a sea lice on it, that salmon is history. There's no, nothing, nothing that can be done for that baby salmon to survive. What helps sea lice is when you swim from salt water into fresh water. So the fish swimming up the stream, the sea lice die in fresh water. But now this salmon is starting its journey into the ocean, into salt water, and that sea lice is attached to that salmon for the rest of its life. That salmon is doomed. Besides sea lice and all the other diseases in the bottom of the ocean and this and that, salmon farms require a massive amount of food to produce that fish. It takes a very high fat content, very high protein. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. Three pounds of wild harvested protein to make one pound of salmon. So they're actually, it's a net depletion of protein. The salmon farms know this 
and they've wiped out anchovy stocks. They've wiped, they've wiped out all these stocks across the world. They'll go into Peru, they'll go wherever, and just take everything out of the ocean, turn into pellets. So now they know they don't really have that resource that much anymore because they're under so much scrutiny. So one of the companies recently bought a chicken and pork rendering plant in New Brunswick. So anything that can't fit into a hot dog goes into a pellet for fish. This is common practice. Chicken and pork parts go into pellets. It's cheap protein for salmon. This has been happening in Europe for years. It's approved in Canada. And that's what's being fed to the salmon. Now, because it has a high fat content of food, it's going to oxidize very quickly. So they, now they have to add in a harsh pesticide chemical to stabilize the fat. That's not approved for human consumption, would never be approved for human consumption. In fact, one of the best things that salmon farms say is, well, we use a natural carotenoid. We use a natural antioxidant to turn the fish a color because basically the farm salmon are not eating their wild diet. The wild salmon get their diet from krill and algae. That's what turns them. Anazacithin is what turns the flesh its color. So the salmon farming industry knew that this was one of the major problems. So in 1996, they developed synthetic astaxanthin made from petroleum and not approved for human consumption at a, at a fraction of the price what if you bought and as asked then would be. It's a fraction of the price. So when a salmon farm tells you, we use a natural carotenoid, we use a antioxidant, they're using a petroleum-based antioxidant that's not approved for human consumption, and it never will be. So major, major discrepancy across the world, but good, they, again, they have great, great, great marketing. So I could talk about this for hours, and if you go on my website, you'll see tons and tons of videos on this. Because um, I really enjoy talking about this. And I really enjoy educating and I have, I, have a, I have a passion for this. I have not served farm salmon in probably 20 years as a chef. Long before I opened Aroma Time. I have not served farm salmon. Um, and that goes along with a lot of our other ingredients. I could talk to you for salt about four hours. Chocolate about, uh, I could talk to you about chocolate all day. Um, ingredients fascinate me. Food, the food supply fascinates me. And as a chef, I see it firsthand and I'm really, really concerned about what's happening in our food supply. Um, myself, back in 1997, 1998, I lost about 40 pounds. I got rid of five medications. Um, I was killing myself with my fork because I was eating this heavy, rich food on a daily basis that we were charging a lot of money for. I worked at the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs, longest five-star running hotel in the country. I worked at the Greenbrier. I did my apprenticeship at the Greenbrier. I worked at the Greenbrier. Um, I worked in London in a Michelin three-star restaurant, the guy who trained Gordon Ramsay. I worked for Pierre Kaufman. Um, I worked at a lot of really nice places and I was killing myself because I was eating that food every single day. And I thought that having a happy customer in the seat saying your food is fantastic was the full picture. I was like, wow, this is great. People love my food. It wasn't until I sat down with farmers. Who's read Fast Food Nation? Fast Food Nation book back from the late 90s about our food supply. Remember the uh, gentleman who hung himself in the book? So my wife worked for him. He was a school board president <coughs> in Colorado. Um, we started working with his brother, Jay Frost. And once we sat down with farmers, I sat down with farmers. I said we because I got 10 chefs together, 15 chefs together, Colorado Springs. And they sat on one side of the table of farmers and we sat on the other side. And we looked at them and said, we have $5 million worth of purchasing, purchasing power. What can you do for us? And the farmers' eyes lit up because they'd never experienced that before in Colorado Springs. In a lot of parts of the country, they don't experience that. And uh, their eyes lit up. We started working with farmers, started contracting whole farms out, a lot of us chefs. And Jay Frost came to me. His brother hung himself two years prior because they couldn't make the farm work. The farm was doomed. And he came to me, he goes, Marcus, because of you, my kids have hope on this farm. I used to want my kids to get, leave the farm, get a college education, never come back. He goes, now I want them to go get a college education. I want them to come back to this farm. This farm is viable. And then I started learning about how real food's produced, right? And I was like, wow, real food, real farmers, and happy guests. And that's when my like, career like, came into a full circle. It's about everything I'm putting on the plate. It's about where we're buying from. It's about who we're networking with. It's who we're doing. If you listen to any of my videos on YouTube, and you go in the book there, it's about relationships. Relationships, relationships, relationships. I probably bought 90% of my running shoes for the last 18 years from Frank. <laughs> I don't care what the price is. I don't care about going online and saving a few bucks. I don't care. It's the relationship that, that, that I formed with him. 
That's what it's about. And the same thing with the purveyors, the vendors, the distributors, the farmers that we buy with. I made my policy 20 years ago, never, ever, ever, ever negotiate with a farmer. The farmer knows the price. It's my job as a chef to tell you where the food's from, how it's grown, and charge the extra dollar, two dollars, or three dollars that I need to to cover the cost so the farmer can make a living. And when chefs beat up farmers, it drives me crazy. I'm like, just be a better marketer. Be a better chef. Be a better business person. The farmer knows what he needs, and trust me, it's not nearly enough. He's not charging enough. This is the cost of real food. He's only forced to charging a certain amount because chefs are used to paying for cheap food. They're used to going to Restaurant Depot. They're used to calling Cisco. They're used to doing this. And the farmer goes, well, what's Cisco charging you for basil? I'll, I'll charge the same. Because the farmer's afraid that he's gonna lose business. The good thing is, people are smart now about their food choices. A lot of people are smart. And they know with the rise of social media, YouTube, they can see firsthand or virtually, digitally, that our food system is screwed up. So, um, I, like I said, I can go on and on and on forever. I think I covered all the points on Sam and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to stay here as long as I need to. Um, and, uh, Question, when you go into ShopRite, you say wild caught Sam. That's ShopRite, because it's a big company, typically is on, I was on the game. If you go to the store down here, little market that says why, that, that I've argued with them for years. They finally changed it. I've argued and argued and argued. They told me I'm false. They went in there, I filmed everything, this and that, and they finally changed it, the local store down here. For years, wild Canadian salmon. Year round, fresh wild Canadian salmon. Doesn't exist. A lot of the labels, if you look in small print, will say previously frozen. Perfectly, right, they will. Refresh, previously frozen, exactly. Now, ShopRite will have, or stores will have, wild salmon that's frozen. Look at, look, just take a look. A lot of it's product of China, packaged in China. Alaskan king crabs, caught in Alaska, packaged in China. As Soon as you cross the border from the Bering Sea into, into Russia, there's no quotas. They will, they, will, they will destroy everything. They just catch, 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 catch. So a lot of chefs will say Alaskan king crab. It's not Alaskan king crab, it's Russian king crab. And the population's getting decimated. So, and it's probably packaged in China. It's cheaper for a company, calamari. Most calamari you eat, in, eat, eat in restaurants, it's from China. If it's not caught in China, it's caught in Rhode Island and shipped to China to be packaged and shipped back, shipped back. 20 cents a pound to ship a product from the East Coast to China, packaged, processed, labor, everything gets sent back. 20 cents round trip and it's done. That's where our job force is going. Because chefs, because we want, chefs want cheaper food, we want cheaper food. The calamari buys twice the price. I would never think about buying the other stuff. And there's not many U.S. suppliers, producers, all in house that that do it because they they can't they can't afford twenty cents a they can't compete with twenty cents a pound round trip. You can't. Thank you.